welcome everyone to this very special uh, edition of uh, Het Denkelag. Um, apologies for the delay, uh, we won't keep you waiting uh, for longer. I'm very honored to be your uh, host and your moderator tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, we started out last year uh, with a um, couple of episodes, um, very informal uh, discussions actually about science, uh, philosophy, uh, critical thinking, uh, etc. Maybe on a slightly smaller scale than, uh, than today. Uh, but we decided to uh, move up to the next level. We're a little uh, more ambitious. And uh, we even decided to call uh, this episode a uh, Royale edition. Uh, and if you have a look at our um, distinguished uh, panel here tonight, I think you uh, will understand why we uh, chose this slightly pompous title. We thought that with, with this um, concentration of um, brain power, we or, might as well power. tackle some of <laughs> the big issues, you know. Uh, so this could um, equally have been called um, uh, an, an episode about life, the universe, and, uh, and everything. Oh, I know the answer to that one. Right, <laughs> well, just try to keep nothing. it like, try yeah. not to reveal <laughs> the secrets until, uh, <laughs> right, until we have calculated it. Um, so before we uh, go down into that rabbit hole, uh, let me very uh, briefly introduce uh, our guests. Uh, maybe they hardly need any introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, on the far side, the gentleman there who seems to know the answer to life, the universe and everything, uh, is uh, <laughs> Professor Dr. Massimo uh, Pigliucci. He is um, the head of the uh, philosophy department at the City University of New York. He is a biologist turned philosopher and depending on your perspective, he has uh, either seen the light or um, strayed into darkness. Um, He's a very prolific writer, as all three of our guests are. Um, he wrote uh, numerous books on uh, evolution and intelligent design, uh, various sorts of uh, pseudoscience, on uh, skepticism, uh, the meaning of life, uh, etc. His latest book because is called answer. uh, answer for, uh, Answers for Aristotle, uh, in which he explores uh, how an alliance of uh, science and philosophy, not just science, but science and philosophy, uh, can make our lives uh, more meaningful. Um, in the middle is uh, Professor Daniel Dennett. He is um, a philosopher and a cognitive scientist at uh, Tufts uh, University near Boston. He is um, famous for being one of the four horsemen of uh, the apocalypse, together with his uh, new atheist uh, colleagues, uh, the biologist uh, Richard Dawkins, the philosopher Sam Harris, and the late uh, Christopher Hitchens. He is arguably the most friendly, most amiable <laughs> of the four <laughs> atheists. I think I can say so. I hope you will agree. The softest. Oh. Um, I can oh. tell you. He's sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dare I say cuddly? No. Yeah. Yeah. He's very cuddly. Um, he wrote also numerous books on uh, evolution, uh, philosophy of mind, uh, consciousness, free will. He has an oeuvre that spans uh, more than uh, uh, four decades. His... Uh, most important work is maybe... Well, what is your most important work, <laughs> Professor Dennett? <laughs> <laughs> you are about to walk right. into a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Probably consciousness explained. Right, consciousness explained. I think that's a very good choice. Uh, as you wrote it, of course, I'm not <laughs> sure mine. you say so. <laughs> Anyhow, his latest book uh, provides, uh, provides an overview of his work and is uh, titled Intuition Pumps and Other Tools uh, for Thinking. It is translated into Dutch, if I'm ah, not mistaken, as uh, ah. De Gereedschapskist van Ons Denken. Um, next to me is uh, Professor uh, Lawrence Krauss. He's a theoretical physicist and uh, cosmologist. He is the director of the Origins Project at uh, Arizona State University. He has also written uh, numerous books, uh, among them um, The Physics of Star Trek, um, Quintessence, and his latest book, um, a universe from nothing. How or why? Uh, there is something uh, rather than nothing. Uh, he is also one of the, the two stars in a film documentary called The Unbelievers, which uh, follows uh, Professor Krauss uh, and his uh, atheist uh, colleague, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, whom you may remember as one of the four horsemen, around the world, spreading, can I use the word gospel here, the, <laughs> the message of science and reason. I'm, apologies for that. 
not the gospel. So just um, to um, kick things off, um, I'm um, going to tell a little story from uh, Greek mythology. Uh, according to the, the Greeks, um, there was um, a message written above uh, the pillars of Gibraltar. Um, uh, it was written by the hero uh, Hercules, and it served as a warning. You can see it, actually, or you should be able to see it. Uh, it served as a warning to sailors and navigators uh, not to venture beyond that point, which marked the edge of at least the known world uh, at that point. In Latin, uh, it's the phrase is uh, nec plus ultra, or non plus ultra, and it translates uh, roughly as uh, no further beyond. This is the end of, uh, of the world. Th those Greeks really knew their Latin. Yeah, yeah right, right. I was <laughs> looking for the Greek phrase, actually. I don't know why. I was blaming on Wikipedia, right, on, on my... I haven't written these notes myself. So. <laughs> um, I have another few. Uh, later on, the opposite of the phrase, plus ultra, again, uh, quite uh, impressive for, for those Greeks, um, <laughs> was adopted uh, centuries later uh, as the national motto of Spain. Uh, and it was actually, as you, as you can tell, it was an invitation um, in defiance of the ancient wisdom to go further, to explore new territories, which was, of course, after the discovery to of uh, the new world. Right. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Yeah. Right, and you, ha you don't have to be afraid about monsters and sea dragons, and, or you don't have to be afraid to be swallowed up into the pits of hell. Um, just go as far as you can and, and see where, where you end up. Uh, Charles V, by the way, was actually born here in Ghent, and this brings us right back uh, to the debates. Uh, you probably know uh, what I'm getting at, where this is going. Uh, so I'm going to put this open question to all of you. Uh, do you think that there is a neck plus ultra in science? Do you think that science has limits? Do you think it is dangerous for science to venture beyond the point uh, where it is not allowed to go? I don't know who, who is willing to go first. Well, let's the scientists go first, right? Right. I was going to say you go first. But all right, fine. We'll go this way because you guys sure. introduce first. Sure. Uh, I hate the phrase limits of science because it's so often misinterpreted as, you know, if it, as if there were really a signpost that said, you know, sorry, you're, you're allowed to get here, but not beyond. But it depends on what you mean by the phrase, right? I mean, clearly there are limits to science because science is a human activity and human beings have limited, you know, epistemic capabilities. We, we can understand certain things and I'm sure there are certain things that we're not going to be able to understand. Um, even if we were smart enough, there are certainly things that we don't have or we're not going to have enough information to uh, figure out. So in that sense, certainly there are limits to science. So that's one, one sense in which it's true. Um, uh, but it's no comfort to you know, theologians or, or uh, mystics or, or, or woo-woo thinkers of any sort. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a side post. The other uh, sense in which I think there may be a limit to science, and maybe that, that may be a little more controversial tonight, is that I think that science is a particular type of uh, of epistemic activity, it's a particular way of, of getting to know things, in particular it's the best way we figure out to know about how the world works, um, but as such, as a human activity, it does have certain domain of applications where it does very well, and it has, has domains of applications where it does a little less well, and it has domains of applications where it frankly doesn't really matter that much. Now it gets interesting. Right. <laughs> So that is the limit of science, in the sense of is In that sense, right. in the sense that it's, you know, science is a set of tools, and right. since not all problems are, are amenable to the same kind of tools, right. uh, then there are certain things you really don't want to do, use a hammer because they're not nailed. Right. right. Professor Grass, do you agree? Well, I, in many ways I agree. In fact, it's sort of unfortunate it's called a debate. I think people will be upset because there, uh, there won't be so much disagreement. I was saying to Dan in the car that well, we'll we're, all that. we're all we're reasonable people. <laughs> we're all reasonable people on this stage and how could any reasonable person disagree with me and Dan? Um, but anyway. <laughs> Never um, happened before. <laughs> but, but certainly there are limits to science. As, it, as an empiricist, which is what I am, um, empirically there are limits to what science can do. In fact, in my own field, cosmology, there are clearly limits because we are... We are um, we have one universe to, to observe, and most of us live in that universe. The Republican Party in my country doesn't. But, <laughs> but, but um, the, the, uh, there it is. so therefore, Proof because of, of that, there may be many universes, and therefore there's a, obviously, in some real physical sense, a limited domain over which we can explore. And that's the key point. It's not just tools. All of, every academic discipline 
uses tools, and, they're, and in some ways they're not that different. But, but the key part of what, what makes science science and what makes it work is it's based on empirical evidence, sort of rational thought applied to empirical evidence. And therefore, if you can't measure it, even in principle, I mean, there's lots of things we can't measure that we can talk about. As a theoretical physicist, I think about things a lot, a lot of things we can't measure right now. But if you can't ever measure it in principle, then, then science really has nothing to say about it. I would argue that m anything else you tend to say about it is not worth much either. But, uh, uh, but it's certainly Careful. a fact that science generally can't address it if you can't measure it in principle. And, and that's, um, that's of fundamental importance, I think, and we forget that. And so I think um, the difference that I would say is that the limits, I don't, is that I don't know what the ultimate limits to science are. There are limits now, and there are many areas where science has very little to say right now. But can I say that it will never have anything to say about it? Absolutely not. There's a huge difference between what's unknowable and what's not known. And so the only way you can find out if science has anything to say about it is try. Right. And if it, if it has something useful to say that make pr predictions which agree with experiments, then it, you can make progress. But you can try it and it might not work. And an example right. you know, might be sort of sociology where they tried to use the language of physics to apply to societies and it was far too premature, they're too, right. much too complex. And, Consciousness, which is, as I was telling Dan, if I, you know, I, I did physics because it's easy. If I want to do the hard stuff, mm -hmm. I do consciousness. Right. Am yeah. I right that you say that even if there are limits to science, and we, we may never know, uh, then that doesn't provide any comfort to people advocating other ways of knowing. If I science has I, limits, then let me, let me maybe that's a general limit. Let like. me jump, say something that Massimo may jump on, just for the purpose of um, entertainment. Um, <laughs> I don't think there are other ways of knowing. If you talk about uh -huh. what knowing is, other ways of knowing are an illusion, in my opinion. Right. That ultimately, when you think about what you know, it doesn't come by revelation. It ultimately comes from some empirical basis. And of course, you can reflect on it and think about it and learn things based on that reflection, but it ultimately comes down to what you can measure. And therefore, I don't think there are other ways of knowing. Right. And maybe that's an Professor Dennett, is, is it right that every knowledge is derived from empirical evidence, that this is the well, sole source of knowledge? Or I would say no, because I think there's a lot of mathematical knowledge, and I don't think that mathematical knowledge is based on empirical facts. Uh, uh, formal systems, uh, 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 it, uh, mathematical knowledge comes, uh, is inspired by empirical issues. After all, just think of what geometry means. It means measuring the earth. And, uh, but, but once you've got geometry, then you have non-Euclidean geometries and but, other sorts of geometries. But don't you think you're, I mean, a proof is an empirical piece of work. I mean, it's no. a, it's, it, it, no, it's, no, it, it is. It, it, it well, is. I mean, you, well, you can an, ask, is it consistent yeah. with what you know there's, already? There's an important empirical side, which is, I think, often underestimated. And this came out like a ton of bricks for me uh, when I saw a, a wonderful documentary that was done on Andrew Weil's proof of Fermat's Fermat last theorem. Session. And here were these number theorists trying to explain it to the general public and to people like me who are no number theorists. And what hit me was, oh, first of all, not only would I not know whether Wiles had proved Fermat's last theorem, Wiles wouldn't know whether he'd proved Fermat's last theorem until, and this is a, basically a sociological or a social fact, until his peers, his fellow experts sure. in mathematics, reluctantly and contra their own interests, they would love to win the glory, say, he's got it. Right. And it's only when the consensus among ma mathematicians is he did it. That's the first time anybody has any confidence that, that the proof is, is actually sound. Sure, but, but that, right. that's true. But, but I think yeah. that we should be careful here in, in uh, I'm going to follow up on Dan's comment on mathematics, which is one example. Logic, of course, is another one. Uh, and they're closely related for obvious reasons. But 
I think we need to be careful about how we use the wor words like science or empirical evidence and so on and so forth, because yes, if you expand empirical evidence to say, including the, the uh, cross-checking of proofs, then pretty much everything that deals with language becomes em empirical. Yeah, even yeah. theology would that become empirical. But uh, yeah, exactly. But I think that that is, in some sense, cheating because when people think of science, even when most people, most scientists think of science, that's not what they're thinking about. What you're thinking about when you talk about science, we're talking about the way in which normally physics, biology, chemistry, geology, and so on work. So obs systematic observations, controlled experiments, that sort of stuff. Now, if you limit you know, science to that kind of view, then it seems to me clear that, you know, mathematics has very little to do in terms, or logic has very little to do with it. It certainly has implications for science. Mm -hmm. It certainly gets its inspirations occasionally from science, but a lot of mathematics and logic work is well, without well, I mean, I think with, right. I mean, with semantics, I think I agree with yeah. you that it's a semantic difference. For me, science is, is obviously much more expansive because ultimately mathematics, I mean, mathematics is a language. It isn't knowledge, by the way, it's a language. And it doesn't, it's, it's not the world. It's a model of the world, and it doesn't describe the world exactly. It's a model of the world. It's the best model we have, but there's no mathematics that exactly describes the world at all levels. So even that, even people who think that somehow mathematics is an ultimate uh, uh, description reality, it isn't. There's no mathematical formula that describes the universe at all scales. But nevertheless, when, when Weil or, or, or his colleagues are trying to determine if it's true, what they're ultimately doing is seeing if it's consistent with things they know to be true, and ultimately mm -hmm. those things come from a set of, uh, of axioms which are in some sense empirical. And so right. uh, yeah, I exactly. tend to think of it, I, I, my view of any, it, science is really empiricism, right. and my view of empiricism is very broad. And so, you know, we can disagree about whether my definition is your definition, but I think when we deconstruct that, we'd probably agree. Right. So it's but, partly a uh, semantic issue, but maybe before we go any further, I had the idea of um, checking with the audience, because now they, they haven't <laughs> given a, an, an, a, you know, um, a, a sense of your, um, your initial position and also some semantic clarification. So I think it's time to, uh, to ask the audience, um, if, if we f phrase it like this, do you think that um, science is the sole source of knowing, and there may be all sorts of confusion. If there are philosophers in the room, sorry, you have to get rid you know, <laughs> ignore s semantics Abstain. for a while. So, uh, in Dutch, wie denkt, of denkt u dat wetenschap de enige bron van kennis is? Let's just raise hands and see what is, what, what people, place, don't be shy, so just, uh, even if you don't well, really know what the question is about, you can be confident that really you, <laughs> you can have an answer. Nobody's going to check if you yeah. really thought it true. Raise, the, raise right. the house lights. Then that's, we can, that's, pretty that's empiricism. Yeah, it's a, a, a lot of people who are um, I can't all see, in so favor of science. Yeah. So, and who thinks that besides science, there are other ways of knowing? Dus wie denkt dat er uh, naast wetenschap ook nog andere yeah, kernvormen right. zijn? Dus wetenschap uh, is niet uh, het alpha en omega. Well, I, I, I think that the majority of people, if I'm correct, is in favor of the view that science rules supreme. So we have, do we have some work to do? Uh, there, yeah, that's too bad. So, so let's, right. let's get to work. Let's get to work. <laughs> I think we want, just to get it a little more uh, specific, mm. let's jump to one of our uh, topics. I think I remember that, I'm sorry. Dan was about to comment on the last thing that, that Lawrence said uh, about uh, the expansive definition right. of science. Right, if you, did uh, I you have a short yeah. comment to make before yeah, we move to um, I think that your definition as empiricism it raises some semantic problems. Yeah, semantic problems. So, right. for instance, I think you know that there is no largest prime. I think you know that 2 plus 2 is 4. I think you know that the but, uh, interior uh, angles of a Euclidean triangle add up to two right angles. But those are based on empirical... No, but I do, I do on the basis of empirical evidence of what... I know there's no largest prime because the proof of largest primes relies on things I can see, work with, and uh, manipulate. Right. But then, you see, you are using... You're, you are using the very point I was making about, about using basically social facts about what ma mathematicians agree on and no, so forth. No, I don't care who told me the well, fact. I mean, you I, do. the numbers are there. It you doesn't do. matter whether Look, they were if, white if, males or, if, or not. No, if there was, if there was a, a, a coven of mathematicians in, in Utah. There probably that, is. You know, there probably okay. is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and they, <laughs> they claim to have you know, proved the ABC conjecture. You'd probably think, not likely, not <laughs> likely. No, I, I yeah. tend to think it's not likely whenever I read anything anyone says. Yes. You well, know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, my first response is, convince me. Right. Yeah. I mean, I bet it's your first response, I hope. Speaking well, of things that are not likely, 
Yeah. Let's talk about God. Do we have to? Can well, we talk about well, just, knowledge or reality or just something? Just to get, to get okay. it over with. I know it's, uh, we can, uh, as yeah. soon as we have uh, dealt with God, we can yeah. move on to less frivolous matters. Okay, it should take a minute. More weighty subjects. But let's just try to I'm have... I'm sorry, you're, ask, you're asking three atheists here, right? right? You're, I you know. understand so, that. Okay. Well, right. last time we checked, as you, as you say, none of you have any religious faith. Um, <laughs> this was before but a dinner. I think... Uh, Right. I have faith in it. But the question is, do you think that uh, science, no matter how you define it, or maybe it depends, um, has disproven uh, or ah. refuted uh, God's existence? Well, do you think that God is a scientific you hypothesis? You can't disprove an unprovable hypothesis. An right. Un that is an interesting but answer. Can, right. But you can render it so preposterously That's unlikely that, that you, you, uh, anybody who still takes it seriously... Right has a serious problem. Yeah, that's and, what I and, and, and I think that's really important. And science has definitely done that. Yeah. In a, in a, in a, but there are different levels. And I, you know, people are in this audience, some of them may be spiritual. They say, oh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I never know what that means. But, uh, but, but there are people who would say, well, you know, I think there's some, there's some purpose to the universe. I'm not, I don't believe in the world's religion. There's some purpose. And it, that, I think, it, it is, I think, I think it is an overstatement to say that there is none. What we can say is there's absolutely no evidence of purpose to the universe. But what we can say, and what I think is really important, is that science is inconsistent with every religion in the world. Mm -hmm. That every organized religion based on scripture and doctrine, that is inconsistent with science. So they're all garbage and nonsense. Right. That you can say with, 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 with definitive authority. I don't like to use right. the word authority. But the <laughs> idea of purpose Vague purpose. All I can say is there's no evidence for it, and every bit of evidence suggests that it isn't there. But, you know, who, you know how can you go right, beyond yeah. that? I can, I can, I'm going to go even a little further, if possible. I mean, they, they've done a perfectly good job at demolishing the whole thing. But, but you can go even further. So I get nervous whenever I hear people talking about the God hypothesis, because I think that's conceding too much. Yeah. Right. It's a idea concept of that, that uh, Richard Dawkins uses the, in right. well, your yeah. And so it seems to me that in order to talk about a hypothesis, uh, you really have to have something you know, fairly well articulated, coherent, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, that makes predictions that are actually falsified, all that sort of stuff. And concepts of God, first of all, heterogeneous, because you yeah. know, th let's not forget that it's, there's, it's not like all people on earth mm -hmm. believe in a particular uh, kind of God. There's all sorts of stuff out there. But all these concepts are incoherent, they're badly um, uh, you know, put together, if put together at all. So to say that science sort of um, defeats the God hypothesis is actually even to give too much yeah. to yeah. the concept of God. It's, there's nothing to defeat there. It's, it's an incoherent, badly uh, articulated concept. Right. So what, why do you use it's a, a sledgehammer to... You wrote that it's not even compound. wrong. Yeah. Yes. When you refuse to think, you call it God. Yeah. But that right. does bring me back, if you don't mind, to the right. issue of semantics. Because, of course, it's, you know, it depends on what you mean by God. It's part of the answer, right? Right, yeah. But let um, me put it another way. If you, can you think of any empirical, scientific, solid evidence that would convince you of the existence of some supernatural creator sure. that you would call yeah. God? I oh, mean, yeah, if, sure. if he would sure. just burst through the, the roof then here I and, and point at the three of you and say, stop. Now that I would think it's uh, now that I would think it's the beer or the whiskey talking. Yeah. Right. Now, now that that wouldn't do it. But no, there's plenty of things you could do. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. we we go out uh, at night and all of a sudden the stars are rearranged and say, "You suckers, you better in believe." Aramaic. <laughs> Only in Aramaic, what I believe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, something like, and everybody can see them, not yeah, just yeah. me, because you know, right. then, then I st then I go back to the whiskey hypothesis. Um, <laughs> But actually, there is more, more interesting ways of doing it. I just rest, uh, read recently a, a, a sci-fi novel, which, you know, I, I tend to think of good science fiction as thought experiments, in, 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 uh, essentially, like, like thought experiments in philosophy. And this one is called Calculating God, and it's about an alien that comes down uh, to Earth and asks to see a paleontologist. And, you know, the guy looks like an arachnid, so he's kind of an invertebrate thing. And uh, the, the museum guard doesn't get that it's an actual alien. He thinks it's a joke. So he plays along and says, well, would you like a vertebrate or an inter invertebrate paleontologist? And the, the alien is puzzled and says, well, I thought that uh, the only paleontologists on Earth were humans, so it must be a vertebrate. <laughs> right, right. But, so he gets to talk to the paleontologist. It turns out that the alien has very, very solid, very, very good empirical evidence across a bunch of, uh, across a bunch of different races that there, in fact, is such a thing as an intelligent designer of the cosmos. Right. And so the rest of the novel explores how the scientist reacts to that thing. That situation is unlikely, but it's possible. It's possible. So well, it's because it's, if there was nothing that would possibly, possibly convince you, sorry, then that, maybe that's 
uh, that's that's uh, worrisome because there's something yeah. about. I mean, if there's nothing that can convince you, then it almost sounds as if faith, as if it's some mm. sort of faith. Yeah, but I mean, but the thing that would, as a philosopher, that would bother you about that, I think, um, <laughs> would be uh, I'm curious. The, the fundamental problem with that picture is that intelligent design implies there's an intelligent designer, sure. but then of course that implies the intelligent designer is more complex than the thing the intelligent sure. designer is designing, and then the question of always, it becomes an infinite regression. Sure. Who designed the intelligent designer? Sure. And that's the real logical sure. problem. Although, I, on it, to be honest, I always found that, I mean, that is a perfectly re reasonable question to ask, but I always found that question um, a little bit um, disingenuous when it's asked by atheists, because yes, of course, that would be obvious, an obvious question, but so what? I mean, if we really had convinc convincing evidence of intelligent design, yeah, yeah, no, then I'm sure, the designer... We can, we can know, have convincing evidence that I, except we but don't it wouldn't have that be evidence for God. Yeah, it would be, be a, evidence for uh, for really smart people in I mean, another could be, galaxy right. it could that be designed our stuff. Could be right. Francis Crick's panspermia, but yeah, yeah, organized exactly. panspermia. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, where you decide you want to, you know, like that Correct. awful movie Prometheus, yes. um, where you want to seed the Earth with right. with. Uh, or the big yeah. programmer in the sky. I mean, we're all part of a big, big simulation, right. and somebody else has studied the game. The I know Ridley Scott, so I should say sorry. Do you think that you you can only think of evidence for? like a hyper-intelligent alien race and not so much for um, a god or a deity because you would you, maybe you would also have, um, always have this, this uh, thought in the back of your mind, oh, wait a minute, there's this thing about infinite regress, so I What can, do you mean I by god? You mean well, someone who can suspend the laws of nature? Well, somebody outside the well, universe, well, like the, the, Yeah, the trouble, the trouble is that uh, if sort of by definition god is not just an intelligent designer but supernatural, then I don't think we can ever have really, really. Con well, no, I, I'm going to back yeah, up yeah, off on that. Yeah. Say no, I, I can I can conjure up bizarre fantasies, which if that happened would impress me tremendously. Yeah, um, I'll, yeah I'll make one up on right. the spot. Okay, um, <laughs> somebody shows up. I don't care what he looks like, and he says, if you drill down two miles deep into the mantle such and such a place on Earth at, a pro at just exactly this location, you will find down there, you know, a golden plate. I'm going to borrow from, from uh, Mormons. Joseph yeah. Smith. <laughs> You'll find a golden plate, and on it is written the, uh, the genome of um, Craig Venter. Okay. All right, and first of all, the, we, we cannot imagine a natural way that that gold plate could get down two miles under the, under the uh, earth. And sure enough, we do it, and, and it comes up. You know, you, something like that would shiver my timbers. But you, know, but, but you hit on a key point, and I think it's really important, and this is the reason that knowledge is empirical, is that you cannot imagine it. And, and, and we have to be very careful as scientists to say, when we say we cannot imagine something being... Because then if we observe it, we have to try and understand if there is any imaginable way to, uh, to before, we, uh, before we attribute it to the most exotic possibility, we have to see if there's any far less exotic possibility sure. that could explain yes. it. And we are obligated to do that. And it's true not just, for, not just for something as crazy as that. When we see a peak at the Large Hadron Collider, mm -hmm. we're obligated obligated to examine every more mundane possibility before we say we've discovered a new elementary particle. Right, right. And, and if I, we don't, and that's the fact that you want to disprove the very hypothesis that you're hoping for yeah. is what makes science different than yeah. religion. We, One we, of the many right. things. I don't want to agree too much, but I'm going to bring in another sci-fi uh, scenario in, in favor of what you're Very sure that we have to... Sure, whatever. To um, uh, <laughs> a whole sci-fi um, novel, okay. So, so I'm a Star Trek fan, and in one of the good, episodes good. of Star Trek, I most, get extra most money for yeah, that. I, yeah okay. I read your book actually, yeah, um, okay. and um, so one of the, the episodes of the Next Generation that is most pertinent to this discussion is called The Devil's Due, and mm -hmm. it's a situation where the Enterprise happened to be uh, orbiting a planet where people are scared um, out of their wits because uh, the devil has come back mm -hmm. to to claim her due. It's it's a female, of course, it's a, it's a woman, and. Um, 
And of course, Captain Picard doesn't buy for a second that this woman really is the devil, although she apparently can do miraculous things. She can uh, conjure uh, earthquakes on a whim. She can appear and disappear from one side or the other of the planet, so on and so forth. Of course, by the end of the episode, it turns out that sure enough, she, she's just a trickster. She's using a series of highly technologically sophisticated tricks, but that's what it is, right? And that is the problem, that even though it's conceivable that, uh, that there can be an intelligent designer that is, in fact, truly supernatural, meaning that he, can, he or she can actually act outside or suspend in the laws of nature, it's, it's much harder to imagine what set of circumstances would truly convince us of that, because you always have the suspicion that, you know what, I just don't know enough about right, this right. stuff. It could be well, that it's the enterprise out there doing it's this. It's very difficult yeah. to rule out but alternative natural yes. explanations. But, but now that right. takes us back to the subject, the lim or if, if it is the subject, the limits of science. Right. Because one of the biggest misunderstandings of science is that scientific revolutions do away with everything that went before. And that's mm. not, not how science works. Because what has satisfied the test of experiment will always work. Newton's laws have been supplanted by general relativity, but if you want to throw a baseball, yeah, uh, 400 years, a million years from now, if my favorite baseball team wins the World Series, which may be the next time it happens, um, the, that ball will be described by Newton's laws because it survived the test of experiment. We'll learn things that will change our fundamental understanding, the base of it, but they'll never contradict Newton's laws. So, so it is true that at the limits of our knowledge, Anything may be possible, and we can't presume when we see something strange to say it's supernatural natural. But if it violates things that have been tested over and over again, something that's fundamental to laws or the, the basis of science, it, 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 then it would be much more implausible that it's new physics. I right, mean, if, right. if, you, if you let a ball go and it fell up instead of down, that would be that would a much that. more... Uh, so it's not the edges, it's not the exotic stuff. It's the really basic stuff mm -hmm. that you can be pretty confident about. Right. Um, let's move on to a different topic. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Finally. Um, another possible limit of science is the idea that um, science can teach us about the empirical facts, as all of you agree, but not about um, what we ought to do, not about how we should behave, not about ethics. So, um, Profes uh, Professor Kraus, let me start <laughs> with you. Do you think that science, single-handedly, without, without the help of other ways of knowing, can tell us how we should behave? Yeah, um, I, I do, but I'm, I'm going to use my expansive definition of science. Of but course. I, I, I mean, the point is that we, cannot, we can't even ask the question how we should behave until we know what the consequences of our actions are, very first. The only way to know the consequences of our actions is science, namely, Empirical observation, so you can see the consequences. You know, if you hit someone with an axe, are they going to in the head? Are they going to die? And that, that's so that so that you so before you can make any judgment, um, you you have to know the the consequences of your actions. So that's the first step. Without so the so I, I'd almost turn around. Without science, you can't possibly have an ethics or mor right. or, or morals. So I'm much morals is a word that I'm much less enthusiastic about. Um, so that would be the weaker claim. Well, well, but so that's the first level. Right. But I would argue that after that, that's already going too far. But anyway, right. go ahead. Okay, okay. <laughs> but 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 after that, what we do is we ultimately make rational decisions. I mean, we are, of course. I'm not going to argue that we know that there, we're governed by emotional responses and all the rest. Although ultimately, I think science will help us understand those emotional responses. Um, neuroscience will. It doesn't yet. Um, and so I think ultimately, most of the people who do uh, people who make ethical decisions make ethical decisions based on a set of premises which are generally rational. And so I, I think rational thought applied to empirical evidence is what I call science. And so in that sense, I don't see... Certainly you don't get your ethics from a book of revelations. Um, you get it um, either from... from some genetic predisposition, if, if there are, if there are um, evolutionary bases of certain responses, but science will help us understand those, or from some rational decision making. So ultimately, I think the whole question of ethics comes down to scientific questions. Yeah. Right. Professor Piglucci. Well, uh, I think that, that answer confuses several different things, uh, which need to be taken uh, you know, in, uh, separately. So first of all, we're back to the 
just the semantics. I mean, you know, yeah. and, and you can, you know, it's, I, I really rather not dismiss the, the discussion as just, I hate it when people say just semantics. Semantics I is very important it because it's, semantics is about language and meaning. If we don't agree on the meaning, then we're not having even a discussion, yeah. right? Okay, well so, so the thing is, um, uh, clearly you can come up with an expansive enough definition of science. If you say, you know, science has to do with anything that has even remotely uh, you know, input from the empirical world. And I define input from the empirical world, even the kind of things we were talking about earlier in terms of mathematics and logic. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, everything is science. You sort of win by definition, but that seems like an empty, you know, empiric victory. It's like, okay, now what are you saying then? Uh, most people don't think that that is what science is. In fact, most scientists don't think that that's what science is. Well, um, I don't so know we how need you to make distinctions. That, okay. And also, the problem is with, with that sort of expansive definition is that two can play that game, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I can say, well, you know, philosophy is about thinking, and since everything we do implies thinking, that we're always philosophizing. Well, well we, we may yeah, it's some, yeah. <laughs> well, but, it, but that becomes an empty, I think, at, at least I wouldn't go that far because that becomes sort of an empty statement. It's like, so what? Um, I, I'd like to hear Dan, right, and, then, uh, and then I have a couple more had, things yeah, about consequences to say. Yes, are right, we doing no. philosophy now, or are we doing science, according we're, to some expansive we're definition? ignoring an issue which I think actually gets to the heart of your question, and that is, should we count all of the normative wisdom that we have acquired over the years as science? Again, a semantic issue, but there's a lot of it. There's how to play good chess. There's how, whether bridge is a better game than whist. Mm -hmm. There's, just to take some, some relatively trivial examples. There's, so those are normative. In the they are normative. Right. Now, uh, but a lot of people would say normative systems of thought are not science. I think, I think you would say, oh, they, yes, they are. Well, how can you know if bridge is better than whist if you haven't played either or you don't know the rules? Well, so, yeah, but that's... I mean, but so that's, you can't just close yeah, yeah. your mind and have a well, revelation. No, no, of course no. not. Yeah, but, okay. but still, um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that um, the, the propositions include propositions which say, this is better than that, or this is the right way of doing this. And those are normative. Now... Uh, normativity plays a role everywhere in science, but it does have a rather marked role. And I think that if you think of, say, ethical issues and political issues as, in the end, fundamentally normative, which is what philosophers have mm -hmm. typically said, this is, you know, what counts as a good life? What, how, should, how ought we to live? If you think of questions of that sort as cousins to, in fact, very close cousins to, questions like, um, which is a better game, Canasta or mm. Bridge? Mm. Now, how could you ever answer that question? It's obviously going to be relative to what kind of players are playing the game. But, but human, beings, human beings are such... I'm going to take okay. an example, okay? Chess was improved several mm. times over the years. The castling rule mm. was introduced, the moving the pawn to... to the uh, en passant yeah. rule, uh, those were considered improvements. And I think almost everybody agrees. That's improvements by our lights. We're impatient human beings, and yeah. we just think the game is better. Play it a little faster. That's all it is. But these are normative judgments. They have an empirical base. Of course, of course, you have to play the games. You have to, you but, never but, dream but. of making, you never dream of making, uh, uh, an evaluation without doing the empirical work. But once you've made the evaluation, it has a different logical standing. It's, it's different from just saying, people in North oh, America like this kind absolutely, of Absolutely, but on the other hand, it's not, it's, not, it, it's not only subjective, but it's time variant. So absolutely, it depends yeah. on, you know, the word better is, you know, whether this is better than that depends on who you are, where you are, yeah, when yeah. you are. And so those yeah. are all, so it doesn't have any independent reality. What's good doesn't have an independent reality. And therefore, arguing about whether science determines well, that, it seems to me it's just an irrelevant question. That's a red question. herring. That's a red herring. Well, I it's mean, not, it, what's good? Well, to call it an independent reality is, I think, that's, that's a straw man. Right. But, it's, but, but you in would the agree, case of chess, but you would agree that, it's, that, that it is, well, the question I would ask is, do you agree that it is that those kind of questions are, um, are not 
the answer to those kind of questions may not be universal. Yeah. Okay. And, and therefore, they are, to understand them, you have to often understand not only the individual background, but the cultural experiences, et cetera, and, et cetera. And if we had a large group of people meeting together in a organized political debate discussion where they were going to vote and try to find, try to settle on some rules mm -hmm. for how to lead, lead a good life. That could be done rationally, yeah. it could be done well. And if it succeeded, we could all remark that this was one of the great right. achievements of, of human intelligence. Well, how do you determine but success? But the question right. is, would it be science? And I think, no, it would be, it would be political action. Right. But and, how do you know, no, it wouldn't be how do you know if it succeeds? That's the question. To determine if it succeeds is a scientific question. Is it, once well, again, uh, you, know, you know if it succeeds well, by studying what happens based on those laws, seeing, you know, and then asking people if they're happier or if they, whatever your criteria are. And so in some well, sense, to know if it succeeds is a scientific question. But there is a that? lot there mm -hmm. in that swept into the whatever those criteria yeah, are. Yeah. There is a lot of stuff going on that of is course. not actually empirical. Of course. Look, there's a, here's another way to put the problem. Um, first of all, when you start talking about consequences, uh, it's kind of interesting because to a philosopher that immediately brings up, oh, so he has chosen a consequentialist uh, yeah, frame I've of mind. Yeah, I've heard this consequentialism and all that stuff, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, there, <laughs> yeah that's yeah, not yeah, the only, you know, all that stuff is philosophy. Um, it's, <laughs> Consequentialism is one way of looking at ethical problems. It's by no means the universally agreed upon No, no, way. but it's probably a component of every way, right? No. I mean, even, no. I mean, you may not make your ultimate decision on what is the appropriate action. You might not be a consequentialist. Right. But you probably, but you probably have to at least address the issue of consequences when you are using well, other criteria to decide well, what's up. Of, well, of course. Of course. Of course we are. We all in, do that. The, in, the, in the game of chess, you could say that there are uh, objective, um, you know, normative rules because you have a pre-established goal. You want to yeah. force the other one to sure. checkmate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's only when you agree on that goal that you can have an objective yeah. measure right. of success. You can see yeah. which moves right. are better than other ones. Yeah. But the, the more fundamental question is, of course, if, if we change the goal, I mean, and in chess, but, they, but they are but opposite good. goals, of course, because we yeah. have a challenge, but in morality, don't, don't we have to find some way to, to agree on the goal first? I well, mean, yes. Well, yes. Is it, but is the it question right. is, is that, is that science? a scientific question? I, imagine that there was a great debate raging over how to play chess. Should you keep the, the, the en passant rule? Should you keep castling or not? And it turned out that there were heated debates. There were people who liked the old way, people who liked the new way. And we, and, and we think, well, now what are we going to do? Well. What we, what we could do, hoping that it would work, is have a conflict, get all the parties in who are interested, who cared, and see if one side could convince the other that their way was better. If they can't, that's an empirical discovery. It doesn't work. There's, there's, yes. if, but if they do, if everybody that cares comes to see and agree quite wholeheartedly, look, this is, this is the right way to play chess, a, that's not just an empirical fact. It is an empirical fact, and you've got to test it by, you know, you've got to count the votes and all the rest of that. But it also has a rather different standard. And I think that what, what uh, another way to put what I think Len is getting at is, is that um, nobody in his right mind, I think, no philosopher in his right mind, is saying that empirical facts, or in fact even some scientific facts, I, as it should be clear by now, I take a, a more restricted definition of science yeah. or concept of science than Lawrence does. But, but even if we want to talk about empirical facts, broadly speaking, uh, nobody's denying, or at least nobody should be denying, uh, uh, and certainly not in this, in this group, that empirical facts are relevant to ethical decisions, mm -hmm. okay? That, that's not the question. The question is, uh, another way to put it, what I think what Dan was, was saying a minute ago is that the empirical facts most of the time, if not all the times, in ethical decision making are going to underdetermine uh, those decisions, those, 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 those value judgments that we make. So the way I think of ethics is of essentially applied rationality. You, you think about, you start first of all with certain general ideas. You know, are you adopting a utilitarian framework? Are you adopting a deontological framework? Are you adopting a virtue ethics framework or whatever it is? And then that essentially plays the equivalent role of sort of general axioms, if you will, in mathematics or general assumptions in, in logic. And then from there, you incorporate knowledge about, empirical knowledge about, among other things, what kind of beings humans are. Right, because ethics is, let's not forget it, it's about human beings. 
Uh, if it were not social animals, uh, intelligent, conscious animals of a particular type, the whole point of ethics would, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't right. hold, right? But, but there's also it, the issue of, sorry. You well, you, you know, uh, obviously b what you both said is reasonable in that sense, but it suggests in some sense that ethics has some existence. It's like, take, if someone's pretty. What? Okay, does pretty have an objective? Now, I would not say that science determines pretty. Science can determine why I may think as a, as a, uh, on the basis of my cultural experience or my gender, what's, what's pretty. Right. But in another, but, and it could determine why someone else would determine that something very different is pretty. But it wouldn't suggest that, there's a, that pretty has any meaning beyond that. And, and so I guess, I, I guess what I worry about is when we, uh, it is absolutely true that when humans make ethical decisions, when I don't live my life every day, you know, you know, saying, well, what, you know, what's the rational, I, I act as a human because I have, uh, humans aren't fully rational. Right. Okay, I'm governed by emotion and, and, and all of that. But, so, but to assign some reality to something which is just a construct that varies and depends upon circumstances is, I think, over, overdoing it. And I think ethics is that. I don't frankly. think we, n we were doing well, that, and I don't think no. most ethicists would agree with that. But what, yeah, what I, th do you think? I, think you're, I think you're conjuring up a ghost that isn't really there. Maybe. Um, but uh, and let me, let me Wait, get back, is there let a me ghost get back to, there? to the question that was asked <laughs> earlier, and that was, was um, uh, other, other ways of knowing. I would say, no, there aren't other ways of knowing, but there's other ways of doing things. Uh, absolutely. And I would some agree of them with that are 100%. really good, and right. some of them are really important. They're just not ways of knowing. Right. We so agree completely. I, uh, do you agree with that? Yes. Oh, oh well, then can, can we Great go for a beer? Great, then we can. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, uh, 26 more topics to go. Is okay? Okay. Sure. Um, That's well put. Well, well there's also maybe uh, the, the question I wanted to ask earlier was uh, you brought, the, brought up the example of, uh, you know, you, ha you, you need science to know what the consequence uh, is of just... Um, Anything. Well, just, you know, hitting someone on the head with an yeah. axe. Well, and, th and there is sometimes th this uh, temptation to, to look at brain scanners, for example, <laughs> and to say, see, this yeah. person is suffering, so this is objectively wrong. But th then, you know, uh, I'm, 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 I'm always, always wondering, do we really need sophisticated scientific equipment to know that? that it's just a matter, I mean, we can tell. The we the didn't need science no. to know that somebody Some was suffering. The answer does depends it give on us, the question you're asking. Does it give us more confidence if we, if we have a brain scanner? Because it, but it seems like it that well, now it's a scientific what basis. The, I mean, and Dan is probably the biggest expert in this group here, but the, if, only if you understand what the signals mean. And I think no. the big problem with neuroscience is that at this point is that there are lots of signals and some people think they have some deep understanding of what they mean, but they probably don't. No, yeah, no, but I think that's worse than that. I think that what Martin is getting at is, is different. I mean, there are some instances where science, actual science, what I would consider, even in my restricted definition of science, science actually is pertinent. Let's say, for instance, that we're having a debate about abortion. And let's say that because of a number of, you know, uh, pieces of reasoning, we started with certain assumptions, blah, 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 we arrive at the conclusion that, okay, abortion is... Uh, um, um, reasonable up until the moment in which the fetus begins to feel pain. Let's assume for the sake of argument that that's what I know. Yeah, I Let's know. assume that well, that's what we're getting, yes. right? Well, if we get there, now at that point really is the job of the developmental and neurobiologist to tell us, well, w what's your best estimate yeah, yeah. of when mm -hmm. that happens, right? So sure. that's a clear example where neurobiology or developmental biology but really does... But what you realize that their best estimate is probably garbage, at least at this well, point. I Maybe. mean, not garbage. It's no, a better estimate I, than other people's, yeah. but, it's, yeah. but it's uncertain. But the, the point is, it, that is a clear case to me where science either does already or could uh, very, very likely yeah, in course. the future you know, do that yeah. sort of stuff. But I think what, what Martin was getting at is, uh, for instance, I, I can bring up my, my regular whipping boy, one of the uh, other three uh, horsemen. You mean I'm not? Okay, no, no. sorry, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, never, never when you're, you know, we're friends. Okay. So, um, <laughs> especially for drinking. Um, yeah. Now, Sam Harris, who you introduced as a philosopher, actually would characterize mostly as, as a neuroscience-based yeah, sort of more, person. Uh, and I think that he would do it that way. I mean, when I read his book, you know, The Moral Landscape, and, you know, which promised a scientific uh, way of handling ethical questions, I got through the entire book and I didn't learn anything at all, so, zero, so just new about the ethics, thesis, right? The main thesis of the book, just for people who don't know him, is that you can have a scientific basis for moral right. facts Right. In the universe. And I think that what Martin was getting at is one of Sam's examples is exactly the, the fact that, oh, if you are 
uh, in the process of genita genitally mutilating, you know, mutilating the, 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 the genitals of a young girl, and you do a neuroscan, you'll see that that girl is really going through a lot of pain. You think? I mean, I, do I really need that? You I know, mean, yeah, seriously? Yeah, 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 what yeah, what yeah. does that add to the whole picture? Really? Right, I, yeah. The screaming, I think, will do it for me. Thank you very much. It's like right. now screaming is empirical evidence, but you know, I wouldn't call it scientific. Right. Yeah, so, and and I think that and to and to and to pay deference to my philosopher friends, <laughs> um, when it comes to ethics, I mean, I'm not saying ethics is irrelevant. I'm just saying I think it's it's contextual. But sure. there's no doubt that. People who think seriously about the implications of actions are, are, are ethicists, are philosophers, and there's no doubt that, that, we, that, they, that one can learn from... One doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. One can learn from the right. detailed, complex, logical, rational thinking that philosophers do in, in, in determining what... what Ethics may be reasonable or not, and so I think that's sure. an that's an essential Great, part. Of we it. agree again, so we can yeah. move on to the next topic. This, this is getting too easy. How can something arise out of nothing? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> there is something, and before that, well, I don't understand why people are bothered by that at all. <laughs> I mean, I really don't. It happens every day, and people don't bother. You know, look, the lights that are shining, so the photons that are hitting my eyes, they were emitted by electrons. Um, that are moving, that are jumping between uh, states in the atom. Where was the photon before the electron mm. emitted it? It didn't exist. Right. Yeah. And suddenly, but it's enough for me to see. But it was and a lot of other stuff around. Well, that I don't care. That photon didn't the exist. Photon. Right. So the key question, and I'm glad you asked how, because that's the, as you know, that's the like way I like to ask the question, because <laughs> that's all we can. He's address. careful. Why He's a that? philosopher. <laughs> yeah. But no, um, I can say why do you want but, to? But, uh, I mean, sci what, what science all the time shows how things can, in fact, that the reason I wrote the book is it seems like a miracle that to get stuff, you can get stuff from no stuff. And in fact, it's easy. It happens, it's required. Quantum mechanics requires it. Now, in, in our universe, but it also could suggest that space and time themselves can result from no universe. Now, you can ask the deeper question, was there anything else? And was there... We're, you know, and and that, those, are, those are questions you can ask. But the, really, the miracle that people seem to think is a miracle is how you get a universe when there was no universe. And that is easy to imagine in, without violating the known laws of physics. Now you can ask, okay, there was no universe. Was there anything else? That's a different question. It's like saying, you know, it's like saying, I don't care where the photon came from. I want to know where the atom was. But, but the, question is, the simple question is, how did our universe come from nothing? That is remarkably, and in principle, answerable. Yeah. And moreover, what I, the reason I wrote the book is that if you ask what would be the characteristics of a universe that arose from no universe by laws of physics without any supernatural shenanigans, it would have precisely the characteristics of the universe we see. And it didn't have to be that way. It could have been something else. We could falsify that presumption. You, you, what I, let me try a, a, a parallel Sorry. that I think... I think Nick Lawrence may like it. We'll see. Okay. If it agrees with um, me, I'll love it. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay. Um, it's an empirical question. Um, there are questions that philosophers have been asking for millennia. And every now and then, a scientist comes along and says, well, instead of answering exactly that question, let me suggest a substitute question, which we can answer, and which, uh, once we've answered it, We'll sort of lose interest in the other question. Right. And, but let me choose an example where this was, I think, brilliant and comically failed to achieve its end. And that was Turing in his classic paper. Uh, uh -huh. He said, well, oh, everybody wants to know if computers can think, if robots can think. He says, let me ask an easier question. Let me ask one that we can answer. This is Alan, Alan Turing, the computer Alan scientist. Alan Turing, right. yes. And he proposed the famous Turing test. And he said, mm -hmm. now here's a, a good empirical question. And I think everybody ought to agree, look, if a, if a computer can, can win the, can, can beat a human being in the Turing test. Can you ex briefly explain what the Turing test is? Just okay, I wonder if there's people here that don't know. Probably <laughs> there are. Um, uh, uh, you, you have a, a judge or two, let's just say one judge, keep it simple, and the judge is having a conversation with two different agents. 
A and B, one of them is a human being and one of them is a robot or a computer. Mm -hmm. And the, the identity is, con is concealed, uh, but the, the human a, a, a judge's job is to tell which is, which is the human being and which is the robot. And if, if the robot or the computer doesn't have to have a body, if the, if the computer program can fool the judge more often than not over you know, a half hour test, then we would all agree that is one smart, that is one intelligent computer program. Turing thought that this was a nice conversation stopper. It would end an, an interminable philosophical wrangle which was not getting anywhere and replace it with a question of some interest. Not one that he thought we should set about trying to answer empirically, but he just wanted to point out this is, how about replacing that, that old chestnut with this Right. more easily answerable question. Now, I take it that that's the sort of thing that Lawrence was doing in his book. He was saying, yeah, 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 there's a question about how you get something from nothing or why is there a universe rather than nothing. There, there, you, we can bring changes on that ancient philosophical conundrum, but how about this? Here's a question which is at least very closely related to that, and we can answer it. Yeah, well, look, it's, and it's more than that. And once we answer it, who cares about the other question? Right. Well, yeah, that, it's some, but I'd say it's more than that. So what science can do is sometimes say, the other question is simply not a good question. For example, no, no, this mm -hmm. is very important. Because science can tell us that the kind of ways we're framing things are, are wrong. Like yeah. the why, I think most the, the, of us the, would agree the why question is not a good question. And the, tu it makes the Turing, but, but of course, what I want to add, just to, yeah. just to drop the other shoe on this is, uh, Turing, I thought it was a brilliant move but it's failed miserably, miserably yeah. uh, because people want to, they don't want to settle for that question. Now, maybe they should want to. But they don't want to. But they don't want and to. And people want to know the why question because they really facing. want there to be some reason. Right. That's right. And there may be no reason, and science has to recognize the fact yeah. there may be no reason. But, the, but better than saying the why question is not a good question, which it isn't, because it makes a presumption of an answer that there must be a reason, mm -hmm. and there may be none. But a better one is, is it may say, for example, that our whole notions are wrong, which is where science, get, especially physics, but I imagine it's, yeah. it's happening in other fields, changes the playing field so much. For example, it can say, well, the question is, so what happened before? Where did it come from? Is not a good question. May not be a good question, because if space and time are related in general relativity, when space is created, time is created, and the question before may not even have a meaning. Ta yeah. Before may be something that arises when time arises, and time may arri not arise till after the Big Bang. So that whole concept, that whole human right. intuitive concept, goes out the window, yeah. and it's not the right way to ask but, the question. But sometimes Can I that is. Hold on a second. Hold on a second, where because so sometimes that is definitely the case. I mean, what what uh, you, you described is exactly the process. You know, f sometimes science shows that what we thought was a particular g a, a good question turns out actually to be either badly put or in fact completely meaningless. Yeah. E even. Uh, in other cases, I, I don't actually think uh, that the, the uh, turning uh, example is, is going quite in that direction. I mean, it's a good example in terms that, it, yes, turning failed abysmally to convince everybody else uh, in certain philosophy departments that he, that he uh, figured out the answer to the question or that he had a better question, right, rather. Um, but I don't think that the other question is, in fact, meaningless or uninteresting or whatever. Which question? Uh, the one that, that Turing did not want to answer. Oh, oh, okay. um, so, you know, th there, is, there are interesting issues well, there. Well, then we've got a disagreement. I know, we do. <laughs> but there, is, there are interesting issues there yeah. about the nature of intelligence, the relationship between intelligence yeah, yeah. and consciousness, yeah, yeah. for instance, which are not at all the same thing. You can, right. you can imagine a, uh, a being, either uh, biological or artificial, that is very intelligent right. but not necessarily conscious. But that's, that's the side issue. Let's get right. back to yeah. nothing. No, no. Like the, but the, the, the reason I wanted to get there is because sometimes I see my colleagues in the sciences, and remember I'm a scientist myself, so I'm talking to myself, which happens often, and I usually, right. when I argue to myse with myself... You have to be careful about that. I know, it's a disease. But when I argue to myself, actually, I, I, I get it right. Because um, <laughs> I convinced the other self. Anyway, um, one of the problems with, with the science uh, philosophy sort of antagonism is that it's, I think it's unfortunate that it's seen by so many people, 
philosophers, some philosophers and some scientists as well, as an antagonism, because there, is, there are other ways to put what we just talked about. For instance, there is a model of progress, of, of philosophy making progress, that goes something along these lines. Uh, there are certain questions that philosophers are trying to clarify. Philosophy is mostly about clarifying things, mm -hmm. about thinking about, you know, what does that mean? What do we mean by this? Let's, yeah. let's talk about this stuff. Then at some point, some of these questions become actually amenable to empirical answers, so they go into the scientific arena. There, we have several examples of entire mm -hmm. disciplines, including science itself, of course, mm -hmm. originating from philosophy. Yeah. Now, what happens at that point? It's interesting. So I can, you know, we can mention several cases, so broad cases, like uh, uh, science itself came out of, you know, what used to be natural philosophy. You know, people like Descartes and even Newton actually thought themselves of, of, as philosophers, and then, you know, it becomes science. Yeah, science. but they also right. called themselves, they were theologians too, so... Let's yeah, yeah, you know, I, okay. I, we agreed. But, but, you know, natural, natural philosophy, what used to be called yeah. natural philosophy became science. Sure. What used to be uh, part of, uh, you know, branch of philosophy became eventually psychology independently. And to some extent, what is now philosophy of mind is turning into a combination of neuroscience, evolutionary biology, cognitive science, and so on and so forth. Right. Now, what happens at that point to philosophers? So our philosophy therefore out of business because, well, you know, now the scientists are doing that. Now, what happens in the history of philosophy is that now you switch the, the philosophers, switch their, their interest to observing that newly spun discipline from the outside. So now you have philosophy of science, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of language, philosophy of psychology, and so on and so forth. So it, what happens is that this is, this is a, a progress, I think, because it's, it's philosophers coming up with certain questions, the question become empirically amenable, you know, amenable to empirical answers, the scientists take them over, now there is something else that is the problem, which is, okay, how is it exactly the scientists are right. doing, and what are they doing? The value but of philosophy is but actually, but actually the, 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 the next topic, so I just want to oh. okay, resolve this issue of not on a fundamental right. disagreement. Because I have a, 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 a quote from, from your book, which I uh, uh, found interesting, and okay. provocative, or it's from an article maybe. Uh, so you... Uh, uh, I, I assume that you agree with, uh, with, with Professor Dennett that sometimes scientists can subtly change the issue and we answer always call a learning. more interesting question, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and then find out that the old question was maybe not worth yeah, asking. Yeah, that's worthwhile. wonderful. Um, but we have this issue of um, you know the, the nothing and the, the, the standard philosophical uh, definition of nothing. I don't know. Is, no one's given me well, a standard well, definition. Let's say that it is the absence of something. Something. Right? Well, that's easy. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and you have, you have uh, written that um, before the, the advancements of science, uh, there have been, quote, abstract and useless debates about the nature of nothingness. And you say that to insist on this philosophical notion of nothing is backward and annoying. So we have a, a specific <laughs> issue here. Uh, so there's this uh, quantum mechanical notion of nothingness, which is not really nothing because, it, because it's steaming with energy and, and particles. And now we have those philosophers and also theologians insisting on, yes, but it's still something. You, know, you haven't well, explained... Well, look, I mean, I, my point was just simple, and I suspect, again, well, we'll see. I suspect there'll be more agreement. I mean, obviously, it one provokes, but the, the, the point is that you can't define nothing without knowing what something is. So as we are, as our uh, scientific understanding evolves, the absence of something evolves, our understanding of that. So to require something without knowing very carefully what you mean by it, and what I mean by what you mean by it, <laughs> is what science has discovered about that. To do that in the absence of that is useless debate. And I think, I think it, it more or less agrees with what Massimo said, that in some sense, philosophers try and understand the meaning of things by thinking about it's sometimes what the results of science does. And so, to have a discussion of, and about, debate about what the absence of something is without talking about quantum mechanics or without talking about the vacuum or without talking about space and time and what they mean and all of that is, 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 is maybe enjoyable, but it's not particularly informative. The, there's many cases that I think bear that out. Um, a traditional metaphysical issue is the nature of causation. Well. There's one way of studying causation, and that is look at the best science and see how science uses the idea, and look at work by sort of scientists, conceptual work on causation, people like Judea Pearl and, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And then you've really got a topic. Otherwise, what you're talking about is the folk notion of causation, and then you're doing anthropology. Yeah. Which, I mean, not that that's a, a it's just bootless, but, but it's... It's naive if you think that it's 
getting at the truth as opposed to simply getting at what some human population thinks think, is an interesting way right. of defining yeah, culture. Sure. And, 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 that, sure. and I think a lot of philosophy in that sense, not all philosophers, but, but for example, holding to, the, to an Aristotelian notion and requiring, <laughs> oh, and not, not, not all such, I'm not, I'm not Nobody holds that Aristotelian notions anymore. if you anymore. did that, if you did hold to an Aristotelian notion of something and saying, that is the thing I want to describe, you, you, you're having an interesting conversation about a concept, but that concept may not be related to reality. But Lawrence, let me ask you a question. So, uh, first of all, I actually disagree even in this particular case with, with Dan, I have to say, about the causality things. Yes, you're right that the, certainly the early discussions on causality, beginning with Hume, which is still the starting point, I think, in philosophy for any discussion on causality, they definitely do refer to, the, the, to what you call the full concept of causality. But I think that, you know, I, I've actually read recently uh, some of that literature in, in, you know, technical literature in philosophy of causality because I'm preparing for, to, to, to teach a seminar about this that includes that sort of stuff. And actually, the philosophers who are now working on that stuff very much do what I just described a minute ago, which is they do take on board the best notions that well, come out of to. science. Well, of yes. course. Well, they don't have to. It's not. I mean, well, they you're making, can, a, but then you're making well, a, well, there's, there's a, a moral a statement. They have to. Uh, well, they have to if they want to. Right. Be they, and they are. Honest. So that the point is that they are. But the, I do get nervous when I hear scientists, um, and some scientists, because I don't want to make the the the, the, the um, yeah. general generalization too much, uh, too broad. But when I hear sometimes, say, well, the most of philosophy does X or Z or Y. I bet that most, that most of those scientists have never actually read a technical yeah. paper in philosophy. So that's an empirical question. How can you make a generalization about what most philosophy does? Actually, you hit if the key point I was going to get to, it. which mm. is which may sound judgmental, but it's not. Really? Yeah. Okay. And that is <laughs> your picture. I would agree with about how philosophy proceeds, and it then is a simple empirical fact. And I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it is a fact that the reason. No, most scientists don't read philosophy, is it doesn't have any impact on what they do. And that's fine. That doesn't mean it's bad. I don't want you to suggest it's bad. But, but, but the presumption that scientists would have to read philosophers of science, philosophy of science is just not true. Scientists go about doing what they're doing, being ignorant about detailed questions that, 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 that are not uninteresting from an intellectual perspective, but they're irrelevant to the science. So sure. it is a true statement that once philosophy generally gets to the point where the science is producing the knowledge and the philosophers are, are discussing the meaning of that knowledge, it's interesting. Yeah. And you can read about it if you're interesting from an intellectual perspective, but it has no impact upon the right. science. Well, but let, let, me, let me give you a different case, though, yeah. which, because, because I think that uh, uh, there's a better job for philosophers. Okay. And, uh, and they're always looking for employment. Sur so. Surprise, surprise. That's what I've been trying to do. All they're not going to be put out of work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you can't do science without doing philosophy. You can do it seat of the pants, yeah. informally, or you can do it reflectively. And some people are either brilliant or lucky, and they never consult any philosophers, and they don't make any howlers philosophically. Uh -huh. uh, and so they're in pretty good shape. And anybody like that, I think is, in a certain sense, entitled to say, I'm just going to ignore philosophy. I don't seem to need it. But the fact is that in, in the areas which are particularly controversial, everything to do with the mind, all of neuroscience, uh, in particular in the life sciences, maybe not physics, maybe, maybe no, not I think physics. not physics, but I think I but, agree with where you're but, going. But uh, um, the fact is that they are the scientists really smart people, and they know their right. fields, and very often they're asking questions that are just preposterous. Exactly. You, and that's and what philosophers are really good at is framing the questions. Is coming up with better questions. Yeah, and I mm. think in a few, and, in mind, anywhere yeah. so where science, as it's really what you're saying, where yeah. science is at the edge, it doesn't really know yet sure. how to define things, that's where, that's where philosophy sure. that generally has here, that here. impact. That's but it. but, but yeah. after that point, it doesn't. And that's just well, uh, here's my turn. I have, I have a nice quote from, from, the Dan, uh, from Professor Dennett's book that is uh -oh. relevant to this, oh, yes. uh, right. uh, to this discussion. Well, you already paraphrased the other quote that I had about there is no such thing as science-free philosophy. There is only science whose philosophical baggage is taken on board without examination. But the other quote that I wanted to uh, bring up is uh, from your latest book, uh, I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing a little, uh, little bit. You say that you derive some sort of guilty pleasure 
from <laughs> watching eminent <laughs> scientists <laughs> who have expressed <laughs> what you call withering contempt for philosophy uh, and to watch those scientists stumble embarrassingly <laughs> in their own <laughs> philosophical efforts. Can you give us any names? <laughs> Professor Dennett, uh, who are these scientists? Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <They are> humiliating us. <laughs> <laughs> Off the record, uh, like we yeah, 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 off the record. Nobody's going to know. No one, no one here will talk about it. Um, there are uh, eminent people working on consciousness, working on neuroscience, who frame the issues in just bizarrely <laughs> un unsuccessful ways, um, and they include some really heavy hitters. Um, and I name them. I name them in the books. So I can name them here. I mean, Francis Crick right. had some really simple-minded ideas about consciousness. He was the guy who discovered the, the double the helix. Double together. Together. Yeah. And, and how That's, it worked. You know, he's. So he's. You know, smart, uh, right. you know, uh, you could hardly pick a more eminent or or, or more right. ingenious or more conceptually adroit yeah. uh, scientist than Crick, and yet Crick had a real tin ear for some of these issues when he turned to neuroscience. Yeah. And he uh, sought out the, the help of Christoph Koch, who's a wonderful neuroscientist, but he has not outlived his Catholic upbringing. <laughs> and he's still sort of hankering for his soul. And he, you, you, I can point to the places in his work where you see, look what he's missing here, look what he's mm -hmm. missing here, because he's still trying to sort of save a haven for the soul. But and, he, he doesn't and, think and I could multiply that by, right. by, by 20. So but but he, doesn't, he doesn't think that he needs to read philosophy. He just brashly enters into philosophical right. territory and thinks yeah. that he can just right. yeah. solve. But Martin, uh, I but think but it, notice, it, notice that Francis Crick, Francis got better. He, <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. he learned his lesson. He, and he took on mm -hmm. some philosophers, uh, mainly Patty Churchland and Paul Churchland, mm -hmm. but also to some degree me, and he began to take us seriously because he realized these were hard questions. What really gives me guilty pleasure <laughs> is seeing the <laughs> <Even> books. <now. laughs> seeing the, there's been a, dozens, dozens of books about consciousness by eminent neuroscientists. Most of them are pretty dreadful. Um, and and they, they sink like a stone, and that's what they deserve. But very often, their authors even come you know, that close to acknowledging, if you look at the book carefully, that uh-oh, they suddenly realize that they're in philosophical hot water and they need help from a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And a uh, few of them yes, ask for help, and right. I really appreciate it. When they yeah. do that. Uh, and what I, do you I make would say it hasn't happened in maybe 70 years in physics. But I absolutely agree yeah. in an oh. area where, which is forming, right. where the I, questions need to be formed. But I like philosophy of quantum mechanics, yes. forgive me, but philosophy, I'll just say it, philo philosophy of quantum mechanics, there's a lot of philosophers of quantum mechanics who know something about quantum mechanics, but it doesn't, but the things we learn, but the progress in understanding quantum mechanics has not come, I mean, there are interesting, incredibly interesting philosophical questions about quantum mechanics, but the progress doesn't come from there. All right, about Martin, it's, it's it's Shimoni, but Shimoni's a physicist. He's in the philosophy department. Yeah, well, he's in the <laughs> physics department. No, but, but Shimoni, we can yeah, Google can it. I, can I, I say, yeah, you can Google it. I, I, it, I, I think it's my turn to say something uh, presumptuous, yes. as Lawrence put it earlier. Um, and, and this is it. I want to go back to what Lawrence said about philosophy of science and the role between uh, philosophy of science and the relationship between philosophy of science and science, because I am, as I said, both a scientist and a philosopher of science. And I'm going to put forth, and this is the presumptuous part, that what, what you said a minute ago, a few minutes ago, was both conceptually incorrect and, and, and uh, empirically wrong. Okay. And this, this is what I mean by that. So if you actually take a look at the philosophy of science literature, and by the way, there's no such a thing as the philosophy of science literature. There is a philosophy of quantum mechanics, there's a philosophy yeah. of other parts of physics, there's a philosophy of biology, and so on and so forth, right? So it's a bunch of different things. Yeah. Um, so what you find are two things. There's, there's at least two things, uh, to, to simplify slightly. First of all, most uh, philosophy of science is not at all about helping scientists yeah, absolutely. answer questions. So uh, it is no surprise that it doesn't. But, so when, no people, it when people like your colleague Stephen Hawking, to name names, um, starts out a book and says philosophy is dead because it hasn't contributed anything to science, he literally does not know what he's talking about. Well, yeah, that I is not the point of philosophy of science, right? Yeah. Most of the time. But so philosophers get when offended when some of the scientists says 
So what some philosophers do. It's okay. just a fact. It, it's got other goals and aims and, Correct. and, and techniques, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. It just right. Says, okay. But when there is nothing wrong with something, you don't say it's dead field. You just say well, it's a different stuff, yeah. right? Well, theology, you say so it's dead Yes, field, you okay. can say that. We have yeah, right. okay. um, so that was, his, that was the conceptual part of sort of that I objected to. That, that is, you, we need to realize that philosophy is largely in a different, philosophy of science sure. in particular, in a different kind of business. Yeah. And so, yeah, it doesn't contribute to science, just like science doesn't contribute to, you know, English literature, but or well, literary criticism, yeah, or literary criticism, yeah. whatever you want to put it. Science but fiction, so what? Example. Nobody's blaming yeah. the physicists yeah. for not yeah. coming up with yeah. something new about Jane Austen, yeah. right? Okay. Um, the other part is the empirical part. That is, when you say you know they don't they don't talk to each other, they don't they don't have nothing to say to each other. I am not as familiar as, as Dan, Dan probably is with uh, you know areas of philosophy of quantum mechanics, for instance. But I'm certainly very familiar with philosophy of biology. And there are plenty of scientists that actually do work with philosophers to clarify mm -hmm. conceptual issues that come out of live in, uh, uh, you know, problems in evolutionary biology. So there are subfields of philosophy of science where knowledge and even interaction with philosophy does in fact help science. Absolutely. Okay. And it's those areas right. where Great. science is trying to form mm. the questions. Sure. And, and intelligent discussion with people who've thought about those questions can never be a bad thing. Right. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm talking from a, from a point of view of the area of, of science that I work on, and, 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 and that's, that's the area of physics. But absolutely, where science is at the edge of thinking about questions, um, then, then there's a very fruitful relationship. And I think consciousness is probably the prototypical One of the best example yes. mm -hmm. of, where, of where we're just flailing about, I think, still. And, and, yeah, but, and but let me get, get straight about one thing you're saying, Lawrence. You're saying that cosmology, cosmology <laughs> is an area of physics where... Nothing, nothing useful is going to come from philosophy, yes, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Well, I'm definitely saying well, because the questions... Does it questions bother you that there are many physicists who think cosmology is just bad philosophy? <laughs> well, I mean, look. Which is the ultimate insult, there, of course. there are. <laughs> it used you know? to be. No, the great thing about cosmology is it's now a science. 30, 40 years ago, it wasn't. That's why I also wrote this book. Because, because there's been a revolution in our understanding, our empirical understanding about the universe. So we can address questions that we could talk about before, but it was just talk. We can now actually ask questions that we might be able to, to, to get empirical answers about. And that is remarkable. But, to, but the fact that some scientists say something never... I mean, some scientists are Republicans, again. It doesn't, doesn't <laughs> right. say anything bad about science. But, um, uh, or so, good about Republicans. But, but, so but, but, but so the, what but you're the, saying is that, is that a lot of physicists haven't caught up with the progress well, in no, cosmology. No, but the, but the key question is, you can talk generalities, but the questions in cosmology, the fundamental questions, are ones that, that basically have a huge amount of intellectual baggage that's scientific, that, they're int that the questions are going to only be resolved by understanding aspects of quantum gravity and, and, and measurements of, uh, from the early universe. And so th you can talk about them all you want, but the progress is going to be made in very technical areas of science, be it either theoretical physics or experimental science. And, and, and nothing, and, and there aren't conceptual questions that, that uh, I mean, the, the, the basic conceptual questions, the ones people, they're, they're very bland and general, and, and we've had them for millennia, and, and they're, not, they're not new, and they're not going to add anything to that. They're really detailed questions that, 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 um, that unfortunately, um, it, it may require new language. I mean, but uh, now, now let, me, let me just name, what, four physicists. Mm -hmm. um, Laughlin. Yeah. Penrose. Uh-huh. Smolin. Uh-huh. And you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to be in that list, but okay. <laughs> okay. Too late. All right. Okay. You're at the end. It's a at least Would two, you at least not agree? Two of them are philosophers. Anyway, sorry, go on. <laughs> go on. Wow. And bad would one of them you, is bad. Would you not agree that a lot of the different the reason that you don't like that company <laughs> is because those are eminent physicists who are making dare I say, philosophical claims that you don't trust. No, uh, uh, that you don't that you don't. They're accept. making claims. No, I would say they're making scientific claims that are beyond the domain of what science is now doing. Well, and, and that, and can, can, that can, in can, itself, I think, is a philosophical claim. Of course, yes. yeah, yeah. I fine, think, if you want to call yeah. it that. Yeah. No, but I, I think yeah. it's just dishonest. I mean, 
It's not, you can frame, you can get, dress it up in all that language, but the question is, are you saying something that, that, we, that you ha you're justified in saying on the basis of what we know about the world or not? And, you, and if you're not, you're not being honest, intellectually honest, and, and that is something I disagree with, whether you call it philosophy or physics. Well, but there is, there th those, those four people. Well, uh, I don't think, I don't, I, I don't I apply it to all of them. Not I'm not saying. Out, not quite out of a hat. But the fact is, all, all four of you are very strongly opinionated. You are, you are, oh, yeah. br you're all brilliant, and you don't agree. But no, we don't agree. We might, no, but what we don't agree, it, the, the question is, what don't we agree about? Yeah. We don't agree about questions that are not central to cosmology. Uh, uh, I think that's a really important uh, point. We all agree <laughs> about what the data tells us about I, I the I think those people would disagree about yeah, the centrality of those questions. But I also would like to yeah. sort of caution, um, it, when, whenever we have these discussions, I think that we really should resist, unless we're talking about Republicans or theologians, yeah. uh, the, the word intellectually dishonest, because you know, that, that really imputes motives to people. I mean, I think there's yeah, you're better right. reason to And I didn't impute that motive to all of those people. Okay. Maybe some uh, subset. And okay, I fine. <laughs> but, but, and you're but not going to tell us. No, that. absolutely. I, I and in fact, actually, I should take that back also as far as Republicans and theologians. Professor Gross, yeah. would you but, agree but, that there is philosophy in your book? Because I have a quote here, and I think... Look, you know, what I, I, mean, I don't want to accuse you of... You could say any time you think you're doing philosophy. But Of course, philosophy is asking questions about the world, like science is, and so... Science was natural philosophy, but the key, but I mean, those are, as you just said, when you expand the definition enough, it loses meaning. The question is, am, am I talking, I try to talk specifically about the way we do science, what science has told us, what science hasn't told us, what's plausible, what's implausible, what's known, what's likely, what's unlikely. Those are scientific terms, and of right. course, they all impact on your on philosophical questions, and with the title of my book is you could say is a philosophical question. Right. But it's, you, can I can I give the example? Don't you think can that, I, can we I give the to, that we ought to inaugurate initiate Lawrence into the band of philosophers who work in other departments? Absolutely. <laughs> well, no, no. I look. look Absolutely. I I, uh, I have a doctor of philosophy. In fact, as like, I, like anybody who has a PhD. My that's PhD right. My PhD is a doctor of philosophy, so I'm a philosopher. As right. okay. I view myself there is a nice, the there's a nice thought experiment in your book, and that it's thought it sounds by the way are, are physics. Right. Yeah, okay, uh, but you probably know what I'm what I'm talking about, what I'm getting. Well, at. he wrote so it, in, so in your book. But well, uh, there, <laughs> but there's but, but Einstein's thought parts, experiments are physics. Parts, I should point right. out. Right. So you describe uh, in your book uh, a, a, a time in the distant future when uh, all the evidence that we currently have for the Big Bang, will so our basic picture of the the cosmos, will disappear. Uh, beyond what is called the observational horizon. Um, yeah. So very quickly, so all the traces that we now have of the origin of the universe uh, will be erased. And so future scientists, maybe in a different galaxy, <laughs> even when they are using uh, the best available methods, will end up with a completely false picture of the universe just because they don't have the evidence. Yeah. This is a fascinating uh, idea, of course, and it, uh, it, it's, it strikes me. me as quite philosophical. Uh, and it's also a sobering thought because it raises the question, is it possible that uh, we fi uh, find ourselves in a similar predicament, in a similar situation? Could it be that some part of reality will be forever hidden for us, just as it is for those I raised it. I raised it for that reason. I raised it to provoke Good. that question and, and to provoke some humility in the sense that, that to realize that, that you know, we have a picture that holds together, but, there, but, there, but we have all of science is based on the limited amount of data, and there's things we haven't measured, and there may be some things we'll never be able to measure, and therefore, there could be some, some questions which are ultimately, may, may ultimately, and I say may because it's not obvious, may ultimately be unanswerable. But, the, but it's a leap. What worries me, and I don't want to give people the wrong impression, the reason people in the far future will get the wrong answer is they don't have access to information. So it's not, I'm not saying that the Big Bang is going to ever be wrong. It's not. The Big Bang happened, just like evolution happened, because we have access to that data. Now, we don't have access to the data of right now, what happened at t equals zero, uh, and our picture of that could change dramatically. We don't have access to, the, to information about whether our universe is unique and what's beyond the visible horizon. So that could change dramatically. So it's just the fact that we don't know Everything doesn't mean we know nothing. And sure. that's a presumption that a lot of people make. They say, oh, well, because science doesn't know this, 
I can't trust any of the basic oh, science. Right, and that's right. a real, real... Yeah, that's baloney. Yeah, yeah. 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 we all agree you, that. Would, would but you, it's yeah. a common misunderstanding that yeah, people have about right. science. Professor Dennett, would you say, as, as an expert on, on evolutionary theory and cognition, do you think that our brains, or the brains of future scientists, for that matter, in different galaxies, uh, <laughs> uh, are evolved, or will have been evolved, uh, to grasp the fundamental structure of the universe. Maybe our minds are just not equipped for that. Well, I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad you asked that question because it gets very close to what I consider the bad pseudo-biological argument for, for the limits of science. Right. And that's the, our brains are just finite brains and just as the fish cannot yeah. understand democracy and the yeah. dog cannot understand quantum mechanics, so there must be all these realms that we cannot understand because after all, we're just mammals with mammalian yeah. brains, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the, reason that that's, nice summary of the reason that that's a pseudo, notice by the way, it has some rather eminent exponents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Noam Chomsky, uh, Jerry Fodor, and Colin, Colin McGinn, McGinn right. in order of eminence. Uh, <laughs> Increasing or decreasing? Right. <laughs> Never mind. That out. You can figure that out. Um, so what's wrong with that argument? What's wrong with that argument, in fact, it's sort of comical when you think of Chomsky and Fodor, yeah. is that the dog, the fish, the monkey, they can't even understand the questions. Yeah. We got language. We can understand the questions. What makes you think that there are questions that we can understand that the answers to which are, are not available at any, at any cost, at any price? And then particularly what I think is important is that Chomsky rightly for decades, has been heralding and praising the near infinity of the human mind. Why? Because of the generativity of language. Uh -huh. Now, if there are questions that are simply beyond our ken, mm -hmm. that is, the questions we can understand, but the answers will stump us forever, like a question as simple as, what is consciousness? Or do we have free will? I think I understand those questions. Uh, the idea that we could not understand the answers, the true answers to those questions, has got to mean something quite bizarre. It's going to have to mean that there is no finite set of books in natural language which will gradually bring the reader of those books to an appreciation of the answer. Now, that might be true. Right. Maybe but nothing in biology tells us yeah, that that should be true. It's making a presumption about something you don't know. Yeah, Saying we'll yeah. never understand something assumes you know all the things we can understand. And, right. and, and, and maybe it's a sign yeah. of humility. You say, well, maybe there's, an, th there's a limit to the things that we, uh, we are able to grasp. Maybe, well, but, but who knows? But, but, but wait a minute. You don't know. You, you, have to, you, you have to appreciate, I think, that uh, it's not bra one brain at a time. Right. right. It's teams of brains and all of science. I look. I, I'm sure, without the benefit of the, of thousands of scientists and philosophers who've worked over the, over the eons, I'd be unable to understand all sorts of really simple things. The fact the fact is that I can benefit from all their hard won understanding means that I can understand things. I like to, to point out that that my grandchildren can easily understand concepts that my parents' generation were baffled by. Yeah. Right. And now, of course, there may be limits. But it's not as if we're facing a stone wall somewhere. Mm -hmm. The idea that there's somewhere where there's this stone wall and we're just going to hit blank incomprehension when we get there, it's not biological. It's, <coughs> it's mystical. It's the idea that there is no trajectory through book land and science land that gets you there. But that has nothing to do with the limitations right. of it neurons. It also goes do against the history of, of science. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you know, there haven't been any brick walls yet. That doesn't mean there, you know, we won't come up yet, but there's no evidence for that so far. So why should you make the presumption that there will right. be? Well, Are you equally confident? Uh, no, I'm Egypt? not. I mean, I tend to agree with most of the, the gist of what Dan said. Um, certainly, I, I, I think that sort of the evolutionary argument for, for human limitations is uh, false on, on the face of it. I mean, you know, we didn't evolve to solve for math's last theorem, and we did. 
Uh, there's, no, there's no way you can, you can argue that natural selection somehow favored that kind of abstract level of, of mathematical understanding. What the hell? Mathematicians, do mathematicians have a lot of children? I, I don't know, but certainly not in the place to see. Well, most of them can't be women. So right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's like, but they and, multiply, and the, right? Yeah. Right, they but, but, but all certainly the time, not right? in the place to see, right? I mean, mm. so, so, so I agree with Dan that the well, evolutionary yeah. argument for, for sort of the intrinsic limitations of the human brain is, is uh, baloney. Um, I also don't think that the position, the so-called mysterian position, I mean, you, man, you mentioned uh, Colin again, the so-called mysterian position about certain issues like consciousness, uh, you know, oh, I think there's reason to think that we'll never get there. It's utterly useless because it doesn't tell me anything actionable. Okay, mm -hmm. he says, well, maybe there is a limit. Okay, well, if I get to the limit, I'll, I'll recognize I'll, it, presumably. Yeah. Right? I'll, I'll not. Write you about I'll it. hit yeah. the wall and then I'll figure it out. Then I'll go play tennis. But so in the meantime, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or chess. <laughs> so, but for all of that, so that in that sense, it, I do mm -hmm. agree. Now, I do think, however, that there are some interesting issues, actually, that science, certain areas of science are actually facing right now in terms of sort of human ability to understand things. For instance, there's been a debate in the last few years about massive data coming from, data sets coming from molecular biology and now eventually from neuroscience. Neuroscience is not quite there yet. Everywhere. Yeah, but, you know, molecular biology, certainly you studied out, for instance, a few years ago, not so many years ago, with the Human Genome Project uh, uh, sort of, proposing things like, oh, well, we're going to have the human genome on a CD, and then you look at the CD, yeah. and you figure out how to yeah. make a human being. Well, clearly that didn't happen. But not only that didn't happen, things got much worse. We got into genomics as an entire discipline. You know, for a while, it was kind of comical in biology that every few days there was a new omics coming out. Yeah. So genomics, you know, metabolomics, proteinomics, mm. blah, blah, blah. And finally, phenomics, the, the entire phenomics. phenotype. It's like, yeah. what the hell are these people talking about? Just because they rebrand something, they think that they're inventing something new. Anyway, the point of, is that we may have hit at least a temporary wall in some of those areas already because it was really interesting to me to see, as a member of the Department of Biology, we had, a, at some point at Stony Brook University, um, a whole series, a whole um, series of seminars about genomics. And these people were coming in, uh, telling us all these very fascinating things about gene-gene interactions and networks and all that sort of stuff. And then I realized that the, the, analysis, the data analysis that they were doing, the, sort of the techniques, the statistical techniques to analyzing that sort of stuff, mm -hmm were things along the lines of principal components analysis. Now, I don't know how many people here know what principal components analysis is. I'm sure is. all of us. All of you, right? But it's a, it's a complex, interesting, multivariate, you know, statistical analysis to deal with complex data sets. In other parts of biology is what you do when you have no idea what you're doing. Because right. it's an exploratory analysis that sort of tells you, well, there is a cluster of data over here, there's another cluster of data over there. I don't know what the hell that means, but it's there. It's exploring new territory. It's exploring, like right. So what I'm saying is, uh, the, the, the bottom line is, there may be areas where we actually are already hitting mm -hmm. walls. There may be temporary walls. But uh, there are know, only we walls may be because, but, but in a sense, you're validating what, what, what Dan said earlier. What you're really saying is there's some areas where you find you're asking the wrong questions. And you find you're asking the wrong questions by, by doing it. And you find it doesn't lead anywhere. I'm not so, so you move sure. Somewhere else. I'm not so sure. So that actually is a yeah. good example where that could be a, there could be a difference. So, and I, you know, I know a little bit about that uh, more more certainly than I know about quantum mechanics. So let me elaborate for a second. Okay. So, um, so the, the the idea there is that the question is good. The question that we want to know there, the fundamental question is, you know, how is it that gene gene interactions and then interactions of genes with the environment during development create phenotypes? That is the way things, you know, organisms look, behave, and so on and so forth. That is a perfectly valid question, and we've been making progress in certain areas, you know, in, with that question. But we seem to be hitting an, an area, a moment now, which, as I said, you know, could be temporary, but a moment where the data is becoming so complex and so variable that we do not seem to have a way through the maze. We, we just see a bunch of complexity there. There's all sorts of interesting patterns. But we don't. Right. We're not able to now, extract the meaning. It's, it's already. A, it's already getting that's late. So I, I, I do want to. I do want to have um, um, uh, put up some questions that were asked by the audience. Okay, that's but let me just say. But, but sure. but very I have, quickly. I have you want, let you yeah. go first, then I'll go. Here's go. Here's a a downer of a hypothesis, which comes out of the the new data mining that people are doing, mm -hmm. and that is, what if it turns out that we find that we can use data mining algorithms to get answers to all sorts of questions, which we are very sure that they're the right answers, but we can't understand how the process works mm -hmm. right. at all. Uh -huh. But 
we can go ahead and do science sort of flying blind, relying on our algorithms yep. to give us the right answers. And then somebody says, but why does that, how does that work? And we say, well, it's, but, but it's and that's where we are. That's, 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 certain that, that's I think, a very real possibility. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, we will have uh, scientific prediction will go right on and scientific fact-finding will go right on, right. but scientific understanding will, will sort of, it, it's not that it'll hit a wall so much as people will stop trying. Well, no, I don't think, I think you guys are just experiencing the growth pains that physics has had. And, and, yeah. and the point is, it's happened oh, a lot of times. Isn't that always no, no, the no, case? No, 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 I know it sounds patronizing, <laughs> but it, no. what, what really happens, it'll stagnate for a while. But someone will come, I mean, if, 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 uh, yeah, if yeah. the experience of yeah, science is, yeah. is that, yeah, you'll have what we call phenomenological models, and it, it, an exactly similar yep. thing happened in yep. the 1960s. Accelerators yep. were built, all these particles were discovered, and people just said, the more energy you have, the more particles you have, and they came up with these weird zen-like things called bootstrap <laughs> models, every particle is made up of every other particle, and you'll never, it's too complicated to ever really have a fundamental idea about, and we'll just try and look for patterns and see things, and for a long time, that's what was done. But eventually, someone had a good idea, and, and, and it moved forward, and, and it could be. Yeah. It could be that it forever rates that way, but I don't think it necessarily has to no, be. It, just may, it may be that, just that, that a different way of thinking is required, and some young person here may come up with that way of thinking, Agreed. and certainly that's I, what's I, happening I, in physics. My, in, my intention was definitely not to show that, ha-ha, here we yeah. got it, we had yeah. a wall. But um, I'm a little less optimistic, I suppose, that, that, that when you are, because the kinds of problems, you know, the complexity that you're talking about in physics, that physics faced in the 1960s is literally billions of orders of magnitude less oh, I agree. than what we're talking about that's here. Why so, you know, that's it may be or maybe not. I, may, I don't know. You know. You're absolutely right. We'll, I, we'll I, find that's out. why, again, why I'm into yeah. physics, because it's easy. Yeah. These <laughs> questions right. are much harder, and it's taken a lot longer to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's unlikely. I could be wrong, of course. It's unlikely that, that I mean, it see, they seem so daunting now that they don't seem solvable. But I... Wouldn't be surprised if in a, in, in a few hundred years yeah. they're right. solvable. Maybe not tonight, but in a few. Yeah. Maybe not tonight. Yeah. So, um, which reminds me that it's it's getting late. So I, I want to. But uh, people are having fun, right? People are having fun. Well, I they haven't left. I, I can't really <laughs> see. <laughs> so so um, what if we're all jet lagged here? One of those. <laughs> one of those fun having people the, uh, out there in the audience has um, submitted this question t uh, through text message. Um, if politics. That's fancy. Uh, were based. <laughs> were based or uh, were m uh, based more on proper science, how would it uh, improve our society? If politics were? Oh, if, pro uh, if politics were based on... Yeah, well, I mean, I've written a lot about that. I, I mean, public policy should be based on empirical evidence. A and, and it's that simple. If you're going to try and make a policy, you should generally have some empirical basis for why that policy is reasonable. And if you don't, you should employ the policy and then check and see if it is. And that's a really simple thing. And if it were, if it were done more generally yeah. and used by m most political parties, I think you know, the world would be a better but, place. But, th but there is a downside to, to take very seriously, and that's this. Um, what if the science in question is uh, basically the science of spin doctoring? <laughs> and, uh, Are you talking uh, about economics? And, and <laughs> Political parties who are already uh, uh, using technology in novel and interesting ways. And, and what if they really discover that they can craft messages which have almost no content, but that will win votes? And As they have. The, the Done, whole, yes. The whole, Chuck. the whole premise of democracy as an informed electorate is sort of out the window. Because yeah. sure. instead of informing the populace, the populace is being manipulated right. by images that are scientifically honed. This worries me a lot. Well, I agree with you, but, and I want to make something clear that may not be obvious. I'm not saying that scientists have the answer to political questions. I'm saying that science should, science should be the basis. So what we need to do is not, is inf not that the politicians inform, it's the obligation of scientists to inform, not all scientists, but some scientists to inform the public of what we know and what we don't know and how we learn and how we ask questions so that they can make informed decisions about what they're hearing from the politicians. But even having said that, I'm not saying that, that scientific results should be the basis of public policy. For example, th there are political questions. So you may, 
What you need to know is that global warming is happening. And you need to know that humans are impacting on, on climate. But you could easily say, okay, I accept that scientific fact, but as a political decision, I need to burn coal. Right. That, and that's a political decision, and you have to, but, but to make the correct decision, you have to know, and the public needs to know, what the implications are. But that doesn't mean that the scientific answer, which is burning coal is bad for the environment, is always going to be the correct political answer. Right. That's not the case. People have a, but people have a right to make the vote based on an informed decision that, you know what, I don't give a damn, I want to burn coal. Uh, because, you know, that's just the way democracies work. So right. I, I think, so but we need to inform people so they don't buy the crap from politicians, that they learn the scientific mm. process of how to be yeah. skeptical, how to I, ask questions. And in fact, I think that's a point I want to underline. Uh, all the methods, all the, all the propaganda methods are uh, counteractable, actually, quite straightforwardly, by simply informing people about those very methods. Exactly. And, and getting them tuned in to the fact that, that they are being, that an attempt is being made to manipulate them. Everybody signed up for a critical thinking course. Right. Uh, well, but, that's but what so science should be, right? <laughs> well. Or philosophy. Or philosophy, right. Um, so any, good, and any good academic field should be based That is true. That is correct. Okay. Now, but I wanted to give uh, a slightly different answer. I think that we, to the question that, that was posed, which is, again, it's a question of nuance. I, I thought it was interesting that Lauren's immediate answer was policy ought to be informed by, your first action was not, well, not politics, but policy. There's a difference between politics yeah, and yeah, policy. Yeah. Absolutely, policy ought to be informed by the best empirical evidence that we have, because otherwise you literally are blundering in, into, into, into nonsense, into, into bad notions. So yes, if there is such a thing as global, uh, climate change, human, you know, anthropogenic climate change, and there is, yes. then you, that has to be part of any policy decision. Yeah. Now, the other part, however, it's kind of, this is sort of analogous to the, the discussion we were having early on about the empirical input into ethical decision making, into, into ethics. Uh, there definitely has to be empirical input into political decision, but part of political decision making also does, uh, con uh, is concerned with people's ways of looking at the world, their value, their judgments about mm -hmm. what's important, what's less important, right? So for instance, you could say, um, if in fact you want to you know, solve the problem of poverty, let's say in the United States, then you need to enact certain uh, you know, redistribution of wealth measures and so on and so forth. And that is a fact. But it flies politically only if we actually convince people that that ought to be a priority. If people exactly. say, well, no, personal liberty or you know, freedom of acting mm -hmm. as an independent agency is more important than, in other words, my value is, uh, is high, that value is higher to me than the other one, then there's nothing you can do factually to convince those people. You have to argue about, well, what do you mean by that? Have you thought about the implications you know, from an ethical perspective? What that means is that in order to allow for some people to be uh, obscenely rich, rich, you are actually condemning a bunch more people to poverty. That sort of argument is clearly informed by the facts, but it doesn't stop at the fact. Again, the facts sort of, in some sense, underdetermine the, the, the answer. The answer exactly. has to imply value judgments, and therefore, you know, I would say, Right. right, but the, the, the job in some, I agree with you, and in some sense, the job of the politicians, if there, if there is one, <laughs> is, to th is to then say, here are my value judgments. Yeah. Do you agree with them? Correct. Elect me if you do. Correct. But, but not, here's the facts. Yes. Here are my facts, I've invented you, you, you can so, argue so values, you, you, you cannot you, argue you, facts. You, you say honestly what you're, you say, look, I don't want to solve the problem of poverty. I want to I ensure Correct. some people can be obscenely wealthy and whatever. Yeah. And, and, and they just put it out there and there'll be, People who agree, and if and if democracy has any value, you know, if, if you believe in it, then you say, well, the, if the more people, people like that value, then that's the way we got to live with. Exactly. We're all entitled to our opinions, to our own opinions, but not entitled to our facts. Our own facts. Right. Exactly. Well, of course. So, right. um, Actually, so he, he's I another question. Not. I'm yeah. not, not entitled <laughs> to our own opinions. <laughs> no. I agree. Uh, right. Not, not Actually, all opinions was, are created there equal. There was a lovely uh, paper by a philosopher whose name escapes me, a young philosopher from Australia, who challenge that idea that we're entitled to our opinions. I, I, I thought, he's right, he's right. We all pay lip service to that. And in fact, in what sense are you, if your opinions are ill-informed and, and- Or incoherent. And incoherent, in what sense are you entitled well, to Well, I think Ricky, in, in the movie that we produced, Ricky Gervais in it, and he, he says, you know, you're ent all, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but I'm entitled to find their opinion ridiculous. And I think what, we, what the point is yeah, that, sure. yeah, they can express it, 
but we should be able to ridicule it as yeah, being yeah. ridiculous. And that's why we yep. should be allowed to ridicule religion like we do sex and politics. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, right. what's, ri what's ridiculous about sex? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all of you are entitled yeah, to your opinion about the following question, which Ooh. goes as, uh, as follows. Let me see. Uh, but only because we're Dutch, poor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Only because we're here. <laughs> um, economics makes claims about what is, what is beneficial, what is good for, uh, for humanity. Uh, is that a form of science, uh, or is that will that eventually lead to a form of religion? So it's basically a question about the status. Well, we're economics. not economi economists, but, uh, but, but I'm very skeptical that econ economics... I mean, economics is, is an attempt to make decisions about very complex systems, and obviously um, they're so complex that those conclusions are, are not necessarily um, reproducible if you look at the history of economics. <laughs> Right. I think, I think that economics is fascinating because if you think of it broadly, and we've been, again, we're back to a sort of semantic issue, there's lots of issues which actually are well addressed using the tools of economists that have nothing to do with money yeah. or, or, or standard economic mm. topics at all. They have to do with organization and, and, and influence and all sorts of other things. Uh, I think that, in fact, let's have more of that. But what's also true is that uh, economists being under the gun to provide hard data and predictions that can be quantified have this lamentable practice of operationalizing everything in terms of money. And then, <laughs> as I think even very unreflective people recognize there's something really missing when mm -hmm. <laughs> economists uh, reduce everything uh, to monetary values. It's, it's not that there's some magic ingredient missing. It's just that putting monetary values on everything, everything has a price, is just a, a very blunt tool. But so yeah. is putting an equation on everything when you don't really know, when yeah, the equations yeah, yeah. aren't justified. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the Nobel Prize in economics, the Nobel e Memorial Prize, it's not a Nobel Prize, in economics uh, this year, I was so amused for it because, of course, two people that won the prize have two completely different ideas about what the results of the same phenomena are, which yeah. to me represents economics. So, yeah. <laughs> again, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to, to uh, make some distinctions again. So, um, first of all, there, as, as you know, there's the differences between there's fundamental differences between macroeconomics and microeconomics. Certain areas of economic theory actually work pretty well. Uh, they, they, are, they produce reliable you know, predictions yeah. in terms of empirical uh, you know, verification and so on. And other parts don't. Uh, also, within some, you know, there are different approaches to doing economics, right? There's the sort of a classical uh, e economist who might uh, start with the assumption of a perfect, perfect rational agent who has yeah. perfect access to information, that sort of stuff, and new models that are mathematical models that are perfectly fine as far as models go, they don't match up with reality very well because guess what? We don't have perfect information and we don't, we're not perfect mm -hmm. rational agents. There is another way of doing that sort of econo uh, uh, economics, which is you know, behavior economics. Yeah. And that imports you know, sort of psychology mm -hmm. and sociology into it. And it's, you know, it's much more, I think, interesting and, and probably mm -hmm. more likely to That's why Daniel Kahneman right. is, is, a, is so fascinating. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that, about economics is, again, we go back to ethics. The economists seem to have this idea that what they do is ethically neutral, <laughs> and it's not. Because a lot of stuff, it, j the very fact that Dan pointed out that you know, everything is measured in one particular currency, that's just one example. But a lot of, of assumptions that go in certain economic models actually sneak in a lot of, Dan, Dan will say, philosophical baggage, I would say ethical baggage in particular. And so it's, not, it's simply not the case that, you, that economics is, is uh, you know, ethically neutral. There are these assumptions. These assumptions ought to be put out into the, into the open and say, well, look, if you approach economic problems from this perspective, let's say a libertarian perspective as opposed to you know, a progressive perspective, whatever it is, this is what you're sneaking in. You're, you're, you're bringing into the, the, the reasoning. The reasoning may be valid. It may be good reasoning, but you now have to expose these assumptions, and then you have to let people say, well, I actually don't think these assumptions are the ones that I want to have uh, when, I, when I'm thinking about running an economy. And so you may be formally correct in terms of your models, but the assumptions you start with embed some kind of ethics that I don't like. And, and, so I, and to follow up about to the last part of your question, 
it really is unfair to economics, though, to say it ends up as being religion, because it, yeah. it, 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 you can see no. if it's wrong. Right. And that's the big difference. No. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe a, a, a final question. Um, Already? Um, probably directed to, uh, to Professor Dennett. Um, is consciousness a uh, scientific fact? Uh, <laughs> does it exist? Can we measure it, et cetera? Because there has been a rumor, that's and true. I'm adding this now, mm -hmm. uh, that you would deny the existence of consciousness, that it, you are a so-called eliminativist. So you don't think that it exists. What, what, is, this, is this rumor true? And you got two minutes to answer. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> The trouble with the word consciousness, with the concept of consciousness, is that not only is there no agreed upon definition, people don't want to agree on a definition. Because a lot of people want consciousness to turn out to be whatever it is that is just so supercalifragilisticexpialidocious <laughs> that, that it defies science. <laughs> and it, and anybody who puts forward a theory of consciousness which says, oh, and by the way, it's a biological phenomenon. It's, you know, it's very wonderful. It's, but then so is reproduction, so is self-repair, so is blood clotting, so is metabolism. Uh, for a lot of people, if you take that view on consciousness, you know, the, I often put it, you know, it turns out that consciousness is not one big trick, it's a bag of tricks. And it's not something that sunders the universe into the things that have it and the things that don't. You know, and the, the, the question, gee, I wonder if starfishes are, starfish are conscious, or maybe mice, or maybe how about ants or cockroaches? And they think there's this magic dividing line somewhere, you know, between the oak tree and the human being where bingo, the consciousness starts. I think that very idea, which is deeply ingrained in the thinking of many people who, as I say, think that consciousness divides the universe in two. You either got it or you don't. Right. The idea and that suddenly I, the light goes and, on. And that idea is an artifact of bad imagining right there. And we have to get rid of that idea and we have to get people to recognize as long as you insist on that as, as a sort of a defining characteristic of consciousness, then you, you get your wish, we'll never have a theory right. of consciousness. But abandon that idea and start looking at what different kinds of consciousness or so-called consciousness or hemi-semi-demi-consciousness. As soon as you start getting out of that essentialist mode and looking for the dividing line, then consciousness is a very real family of phenomena, not a, not a single phenomenon, a family of phenomena. All right. Uh, agree, do you have I, any uh, short yeah. final statements about, about consciousness I, or maybe in general? Yeah, I think I, I'm, I'm agreeing, if I hear correctly, Dan, I agree with, with what he said, but I'm, I might be about to just step into a really, really bad situation. So, um, <laughs> it's about to end, so you have to yeah, So as I look at it as a biologist, okay, not I'm as ready. a philosopher. Yeah, exactly. Um, I look at it as a biologist, not as a philosopher of mind, because I'm not a philosopher of mind. And... Um, so I agree completely that there is a, this fallacy of, you know, there is a dividing line, this, this essentialism idea that, that it's bizarre to me. If consciousness is a biological phenomenon, I think we agree that it is a biological phenomenon, uh, unless yeah, we're talking about something completely different, yeah, yeah. Uh, then it ought to come, you know, gradually, or, you know, that doesn't need, mean exactly gradually, there may be, you know, jumps here and there, but it must be in degrees, and therefore it makes no sense to say, well, here's the dividing line, these things have it, these things don't have it. Of course, there is another dividing line. I mean, there is an entire you know, universe that is inanimate, as far as we can tell. And that one, I'm going to bet pretty strongly that doesn't have consciousness. You know, rocks don't have consciousness. But if we're talking about the biological world, clearly it's, it's a question of degrees and not a question of yes or no. That said, I really never understood. I mean, I agree again with Dan before stepping into the, 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 the problem here, <laughs> the self-inflicted problem. I also agree with Dan that, yes, there is plenty of people who seem to sort of equivocate almost on purpose on, on the term to make it more fuzzy, more mysterious, more whatever it is. But I honestly, every time that I read a paper about um, you know, definitions of consciousness, I don't get why the thing is so damn complicated. I don't, know, I don't mean the answer to how it, it works, that is complicated, but the thing itself. I mean, to me, consciousness is the ability that is shared pretty much as far as we know by at least all animals of uh, experiencing you know, phenomenal, uh, having phenomenal experiences. That is, having things, you know, experiencing things like heat, cold, color, that sort of stuff. 
This is this is the ability. That's something that robots do if they have well, these sensors, right? I'm fine. Yeah, of course. Well, maybe, well, maybe. It depends maybe. on what you mean by experiencing, of course. Yeah, what do you right. mean? Well, you mean, you yes, mean it a dial of course goes it up does. Or, uh, you know, or something of course it does. But but what I'm saying is this is you know so if you look at your own your own ability of doing the kinds of things we're doing right now, this is you know that's consciousness. Now in the case of human beings and possibly of other organisms, you have a significantly more interest, interesting additional level, which is the ability to reflect on those experiences, right? Of, the, of, of, of having this these consci consciousness that you really are having those kind of experiences. Now, there's nothing mysterious about it. It seems to me that that goes down to biology. It's going to be some, we don't have the answer, but it's going to be some combination of, well, certain materials interact in certain ways, and they create that sort of capacity, just like materials interacting in certain ways create all sorts of other biological well, capacities. Well, the, the one trouble that with that definition, uh, simple as it is, is that it flies in the face of many people's intuitions, and maybe you just are happy yeah. with it, yeah. because it turns out that on that definition, athlete's foot is conscious. <laughs> yeah, it's like the definition of life. It's very hard. Yeah. Look, yeah. Many people yeah. would say life is something that you know, organizes, takes energy, yeah. build, yeah. but then fire is life. And, yeah. sure. and so as a physicist, I would say the good thing is that it, it's, it, it's far too complicated an issue for me, and I plan to continue to drink this tonight until I lose consciousness. Right. And so, <laughs> so, uh, Professor Dennett once wrote, I think, that nothing uh, you know, uh, co that is um, complicated enough to be interesting could have an essence or something along those lines. Maybe that's a good uh, way to bring things uh, to a close. And, uh, that's an that's open the ending. essential message of right. this debate. <laughs> so um, I want to thank um, all of you. Like, you have been a great audience. It has been terribly exciting. Uh, unfortunately, we have to stop at some point. We could go on and on forever, of course. I want to thank uh, all our volunteers of Adenkelach uh, for their tremendous support and help in uh, making this possible. Um, I want to thank the Ghent University for uh, hosting this event, all the people th uh, that have been handling the technical equipment. Uh, and of course, the three of you, uh, Professor Massimo Pigliucci, Daniel Dennett, Lawrence Krauss. Great. Right. Ah. <laughs>